Well, good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. We're doing these videos because we know that some of you are continuing to stay home and self-isolate and, and we respect that. In fact, I encourage you, go with your conscience. If that's where you're at, then awesome. You stay home for now. We miss you. I look forward to seeing you here again soon. But for now, you're staying home and, and, and we're, I honor that by, by uh, spending the time and putting forth the effort to produce these videos. I'm just honored that you've invited me into your home this morning. Look forward to worshiping with you together virtually as later on we will be worshiping together in person here at River Church. If you have any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and any questions that you might have about the church, they'll be answered there. If you're wondering how you might get connected, that's a good place to go. Go to our website. You might say, well, Randy, how can I get connected? I'm staying at home. Yes, but in January, we're going to have gospel communities and Bible studies that meet online. Uh, and we're going to have some that meet in, meet in the home. So you can go check that out on our website and you can sign up. I'll tell you more about that later. But for now, let's get ready to worship. Get rid of distractions. Go get something to write with and get your Bible. And then you're just here in just a minute, we're going to get rolling. Good morning and Merry Christmas. This is the third week of our Christmas series entitled Christmas Cheer. I call it that because every one of us needs some Christmas cheer, especially this year. It's been a rough year. We need to be watching our favorite Christmas movies, hanging up the lights, playing Christmas music every morning when we get up. When we get up. I even put that, that, uh, that TV footage of the, uh, the, the fire, because we don't have a real fireplace. Every morning when I get up, I put that on. And you hear the crackling fire on our TV. It's cheesy, but hey, it's Christmas, and we need some Christmas cheer. Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, he wrote a letter of Christmas cheer. He told the nation of Israel hundreds of years before G baby Jesus was born, the Christ child's coming. They were in a tough spot. Uh, they were in a dark period in their history. But they were looking forward to the coming of this Christ child. And so Isaiah told them a little bit, of, a little bit about him. He said, here's what the Christ child's going to be like. And so Isaiah 9 is like one of the most famous Christmas passages around, filled with Christmas cheer. And this week, we're studying that third description of the baby Jesus, the Christ child, where Isaiah refers to baby Jesus as everlasting father. Everlasting father. Now, the word father, it's such a deeply emotional name. For some of us, when we hear the word father, just within us wells up this, this joy, this happiness. It's, it's a sweet word. Now, for others, the word father is a deeply emotional term, but, but it's heavy laden. It's sad. <laughs> I think of the Star Wars scene where Darth Vader says, to young Luke, Luke, I am your father. And <laughs> Luke starts bawling and throws himself off the bridge. Like, like that, wasn't, that wasn't good news at all for him, but it's a heavy laden word. It creates emotion. So why does Isaiah refer to Jesus as everlasting father? Well, to talk about that today, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the Trinity, the heavenly father and Jesus is the son of God and and the Holy Spirit, who is also God. And I promised that we would dive into that a bit. And so we're going to do that today. Let's begin by jumping in and reading the passage, Isaiah 9. I sang it to you a couple of weeks ago. I sang uh, the, the Messiah, uh, Handel's version, the Messiah uh, uh, version of this passage. Now I'm going to read it today. Isaiah 9, it says this, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. And then he gives four descriptions. Wonderful Counselor. We've talked about that already. Mighty God. We talked about that last week. Everlasting Father. There it is. Prince of Peace. That's next week's sermon. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Okay, so, so Jesus is the wonderful counselor, like the best counselor, the most sympathetic counselor you've ever been to. 
He's almighty God. He is truly, eternally, completely God. And in today's description, he is everlasting Father. What does that mean? That Jesus is the everlasting Father. Well, well first of all, uh, I need to explain what it does not mean. Uh, Jesus is the everlasting Father. It does not mean... Uh, he is not being called Father in the Heavenly Father sense. What I mean by that is when Jesus is called Father, uh, he is not being called Father in any way to confuse him with the Father, the Heavenly Father. Jesus' proper name is the Son of God. Um, and, 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 and it relates, as he relates to the Godhead, the Trinity, he is the Son of God. The Son is not the Father, and the Father is, is not the Son. Uh, they are distinct in their personhood. Uh, so, they, so though they are one God, they coexist as one God eternally, yet there is a distinction in their personhood. And that's pointed out in Scripture. And we should carefully observe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they make up the Trinity, and, and, and yet we rightly say, Behold the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. All right, you confused yet? <laughs> All right, all right, let's talk about this a little bit. I, I promised you we would do so. We're going to geek out theologically here. What is the Trinity? What is the Trinity? The, the, this is a doctrine, a teaching in the Bible that says that God has eternally existed in three persons. Now, just, just so we can all be, uh, we'll all be clear on this, the actual word Trinity, the English word Trinity, isn't found in Scripture. But this, this Godhead of three distinct persons is all over the Bible. So, so the Trinity is the doctrine that God eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is fully God, and there is one God. I know it's hard to wrap your brain around it. It's hard for me to wrap my brain around it. But th these are the three points. God is three persons, each person is fully God, and there is one God. Let's take those one at a time. Number one, God is three persons, three distinct persons, yet one God, but three distinct persons. Remember John 1, 1, we talked about it last week, and it references God, the, the Son, and, and, and God, our Heavenly Father, Jesus, God the Son, is referred to as the Word. That's the code in this passage. And it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There's distinctness of personhood. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. So there's this distinctness between God the Son and, 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 and our Heavenly Father, and yet they are one God. And each person is, is fully God. That's the second point. Uh, meaning that, that, that each uh, each of the persons of God, they, they, they have the complete, all of the attributes of God. Uh, they're not, Jesus isn't a junior God, Holy Spirit isn't a junior. All the attributes that we, that we uh, attribute to God, like he's eternal. He's all powerful. He's present everywhere. He can be everywhere at once. All of those attributes that we uh, tribute to God the Father, they're true of Jesus. They're true of the Holy Spirit. All of the attributes of God are completely applicable to all of the persons of God. So number one, God is three persons. Number two, each person is fully God. And number three, there's only one God. Isaiah 55 says, I am the Lord, there is no other Besides me, there is no God. The Lord our God, he is one. But he has three distinct persons. Jesus, 
our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. So some false teachings, some false doctrines. One would be tritheism, which says that there are three separate gods. It's like some mystical movie you might see where you go to the table and you've got three gods in there. No, that, that Christianity sometimes is falsely accused of believing that, but we do not believe that there are three gods. There is one God. Another false doctrine would be the doctrine of, of modalism. And this, was, this was, uh, was named as a false doctrine hundreds of years ago, modalism. It claims that there's only one person. There aren't three distinct persons. There's only one person, and then God appears in different forms, sometimes as the Father, sometimes as the Son, but there's only one personhood of God. And, and that, that is not what Scripture teaches um, there are some, the United Pentecostal Church uh, holds to modalism. Uh, and I would classify that as a false doctrine. We, the Christian church, we have always baptized people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because that's what Jesus told us to do. Go and make disciples. Teach them to observe my, all that I've commanded and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus told us to do, and so that's what we do. A third false doctrine would be Arianism. I told you I was going to geek out a little bit today. Arianism says that Jesus did not always exist and that, that the Heavenly Father created Jesus. And then later on, the Heavenly Father created the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus isn't fully God. Those are all false doctrines. The idea that there are three separate gods that we hold to, false doctrine. The idea of modalism, that there's just one personhood of God, he just sometimes shows up as the Father and sometimes shows up as Jesus, that's a false doctrine. It doesn't square with Scripture. And Arianism, that somehow Jesus is junior God. He was created by our Heavenly Father. False doctrine. We don't believe those because that's not what Scripture teaches. Now, let me show you some of the really cool passages in the Bible that speak of how, who God really is and how God relates to us in three persons, and yet he's one God. I think it's pretty cool here. Um, first of all, let's look at the beginning of Genesis, uh, the very first book in the Bible, the very, very first chapter of the very first book. It includes plural pronouns. Let us make. Here it is, Genesis 1. Verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, let us make man in our image. Is this perhaps the first example of the plurality of persons in God himself? Do we find that in the book of Genesis? Uh, let's move on through Scripture, and, and I'm going to skip all the way to the New Testament, although there are numerous references to the Trinity in the Old Testament. But perhaps the most vivid picture of the Godhead, the three persons of God, would be in Matthew 3. Jesus is baptized. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and coming to rest, to rest on him. I think maybe a dove like landed on his shoulder, and that's the Holy Spirit. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Get that. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He comes up out of the water, and the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, lands on his shoulder, and a voice from heaven our Heavenly Father says, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Trinity. And then Jesus men mentions, in, late in, in the book of Matthew, the three persons, known as the Godhead, uh, when he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Other places in the Gospels, Jesus says, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send to you 
a comforter, the Holy Spirit. We have this beautiful picture of one God, but the three persons of God. Now, the persons of the Trinity, they have different primary functions in how they relate to us as humans. The three persons of the Trinity, different ways in which they relate to the world. So, so think on this. First, God the Father, he planned for our salvation, uh, and he sent his Son into the world, the Lamb of God, to, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. So God the Father... He initiated, he sent the Son. And then God the Son, the Savior of the world, he came to the earth. Scriptures tell us he came to make God known in a very personal manner. No one's ever seen God, but God the Son came and we saw him and we experienced what God is like. And then God the Holy Spirit um, God the Father and God the Son sent the Holy Spirit. He, he now indwells all believers. He lives in us and he empowers us for holy and righteous living. So their roles, their unique roles, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and their relationships to one another as, dinked, as, as distinct persons, uh, those roles are set and they've been set for eternity. And the Spirit he couldn't have sent the Son. God the Father sent the Son. God the Father couldn't have come and died on the cross. That was the distinct role of God the Son. And the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, in their distinct roles, they're, they're, they're unique. They're, they're set for eternity. Uh, something that I find so beautiful there is this unity among the Godhead, but there's also this diversity in God himself. It's beautifully true that both unity and diversity is reflected in the three persons of God. And it's also reflected in us, human beings, as we're created in God's image. For instance, Genesis 1.27 Male and female, he, God, created them. This diversity. And then another passage. I looked, this is out of the book of Revelation, a picture of heaven. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, worshiping. That's Revelation 7. This picture is a picture of all of, all of redeemed humanity. We're worshiping um, at, the, at, the, at, the throne, at the throne of, of God in, in heaven. And, and it says that a multitude, too numerous to count, people from every nation, from every tribe, all languages, worshiping together. Yes, there is unity in the body of Christ and there is diversity among us, because we're created in God's image, and so there's unity, and yet there's diversity. Every tribe, every tongue, every language will one day worship in heaven the unity and the diversity of the Godhead on display for eternity. So that's all the time that I have to, to, to devote to the Trinity for this morning anyway. But, but here's the question. So, so if that's true, if Jesus is uniquely the Son of God, that's his person in the Godhead, then how, why is Jesus described in this passage as everlasting Father? Isaiah's description in this passage of our Lord, of Jesus as everlasting Father, is in no way referencing his relationship to the Godhead. The Trinity. For as we've already pointed out, the position of God the Father, it's already set. God the Son, it's already set. God the Holy Spirit, already set. Separate, secure, unique. Okay, so here's the deal. When Isaiah re re refers to Jesus as the everlasting Father, he is referencing his relationship to us, not his relationship to the Trinity. 
And he's not actually giving Jesus the name Everlasting Father. Our Heavenly Father is our Heavenly Father. He's saying this is a description of the Son of God, Everlasting Father. How is that true? How is Jesus, how can he be described as Everlasting Father? Well, I've got four ideas. Number one is this. Jesus is the Father of eternity. Everlasting Father could also be interpreted in English to mean the Father of eternity. Get that. Isaiah is saying Jesus isn't just eternal. He owns eternity. He's the Father of eternity. How much more eternal could Jesus be? He owns eternity. He is eternity's Father. In other words, Jesus has always existed. He owns all of existence. He owns all of eternity. Hebrews 1, we read this last week. God the Father references Jesus in this way. But, but of the Son, the Father says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, so our Heavenly Father is referencing Jesus saying, You're God and you are eternal. He is the Father of eternity. He owns eternity. Going on, God says this, and you, of Jesus, he says, and you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. At the beginning of time as we know it, Jesus was already there. He is the Father of eternity. How else is Jesus the everlasting Father? Well, number two, Jesus is the Father in the sense that he is the source of salvation. Jesus is the Father or the source of our salvation. Father, that word, has historically, and especially in Hebrew literature, historically it's been used to reference the source, or the originator, the starter, the OG. Um, uh, for example, there are these three great, great, great grandsons of Cain. Remember Cain and Abel? They were way back there. They were the Cain was, Cain was the son of Adam and Eve. Uh, he killed his brother. He had, he had these sons and grandsons and great-great-great-great-great-great-grandsons, uh, and they were named Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Crazy names. Jabel is referenced in Genesis as the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. He's the father of all ranchers. What does that mean? He's the originator. He's the source. He got it all started. He started living in tents and ranching. And then everybody that, that, that followed him, he's the father of ranching, the originator, the OG. Okay, J, uh, that, that, was, that was Jabel. Jubal was the father of all those who played musical instruments. He was a musician, the first one. So he's the father of instrumentalists or musicians. And then the other brother, Tubal Cain, he was the father of those who forge, who make instruments out of metal. You're the father of everyone who forges. That means you started it all. You're the originator. You're the source. And Jesus is the father of salvation, the originator. He came and died on the cross that we might be saved from our sins. He is the father of of salvation, the source of your help, of your salvation, of your forgiveness. Third way in which Jesus is everlasting Father, Jesus is the Father of a new era, of a new way. You see, Adam, Adam and Eve, Adam is our common Father in that we all came from him and we are all sinful and therefore we all die. So from Adam, our original forefather, we inherited this sin nature and really death as a result. So in Adam, our first father, we all die. But in Christ, we are all made alive. We all receive eternal life. You see, Jesus has ushered in a new era, a new covenant, a covenant of grace, a new era of life. He is the father of this new era. Adam was our 
original father and in Adam we all die, but now Jesus is the father of this new era. In Jesus we all live. So we are all children of Adam. Romans 5 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So thanks a lot, Adam. Um, that's what he ushered in as our father, sin and death. Children of Adam, in that state, if we continue in our sinful state, we all die, but in Christ we all live. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So Christ is the father of a new era. He brings life. He brings eternal life. So Jesus, Jesus is the father of a new era, a new agreement between God and man in which we are now uh, set for eternity. We live for eternity. If you're not a Christ follower, if you're not um, a believer, I would encourage you to consider this benefit, that, that, that in Christ we are all made alive for eternity. The fourth, the last way that Jesus is the everlasting Father is that Jesus is Father-like. I would say it another way, he is sensitive, like a good daddy. Jesus is father-like. That's what the psalmist in the Old Testament means when he writes in Psalm 103, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. That's who Jesus is. He's father-like. Like a father, he tenderly cares about and for the needs of the world. He, he makes known to us the heart of our Heavenly Father. Jesus came to the earth that we might know the heart of our Heavenly Father. So, so he is father-like. He is tender. He is compassionate. He is sensitive. We know that when we read all the stories of Jesus, he would, go, he would go about and he would heal every disease because he cared. He cared about skinned knees and, and broken bones and, and mental anguish because he is father-like. The, the children would come and the disciples would say, oh no, Jesus doesn't have time for, for, the, for children. And then Jesus said, no, let the, let the little children come to me because Jesus, he always has been father-like, full of of compassion. When he would preach and the day would grow, grow long and then the, the weary travelers would be time for them to go home, he would say, oh no, I want to feed them. Can't we find some food to feed thousands of people? Let's feed them. Jesus did that on, on more than one occasion because Jesus really cared about hunger pain because Jesus is father-like. We know from the Gospel of John that, that one, of, one aspect of God the Father sending God the Son was so that he could reveal himself to us. We would know what God really is like. And we see that in the life and the story of Jesus Christ. God is revealed to us. Jesus is father-like. Oh, on this Christmas, in this Christmas season, I would so encourage you to consider who is Jesus in your life? Is he real? Is he alive? Does he run the show? Maybe you've been distracted. Maybe you, you've you started following other, uh, watching other channels, right? Uh, following other gods, you know, distracted. Been chasing after other stuff. I invite you back to Jesus today. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said this, I have come I've come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. Jesus goes on in that passage and he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. 
Jesus invites you today to relationship. If you've wandered, if your heart has grown cold, if you're sick and weary, heavy, trouble-hearted, Jesus says, come to me. I'll give you life. I'll give you rest. Remember last week's passage, at the end of the Gospel of John, John tells us, look, I've written this book, the Gospel of John, for a reason. He says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you feel like a weary wanderer today, if you feel like you're half alive and half dead, if you're just on autopilot, just kind of cruising through life, I invite you to Jesus today. I invite you to a real vibrant relationship. In Jesus, you will find life. Amen. Okay, well, that's a wrap. That's it for, the de- for today. I want you to know I miss you. I look forward to seeing you in person here real soon. That day is coming. If you have a a need, a trouble, a prayer request, if you would send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, I, along with the other pastors, elders here at River Church, we will pray for you and we will help you in any way we can. If you're lost and alone and you're looking for a way to get connected, riverchurchrgv.com. You can find us on the web. You can, if you're comfortable, you can come uh, meet us in person here on Sundays at 11 a.m. Um, uh, as I said earlier today, uh, we now have a quick and easy way to sign up for a small group, to sign up for a gospel community, to sign up for a Bible study. If you want to meet virtually rather than in person, that's cool. Go to our website, uh, get connected, click that button, and then you've got some options. In just one or two clicks, you'll be signed up for a group, and then we will contact you. It's effortless. It's really easy to get connected at River Church now. Uh, Listen, speaking of that website, now's a good time to go online and give. Uh, We have financial needs here at the church that are going unmet. Now is the time of need. So I would encourage you, uh, consider giving your best Christmas gift to God this season. And maybe don't wait till December 25th. Uh, Again, the the need is now at River Church. So if you would go online and give, many of you give extravagantly. You give generously. And I I just say, keep doing what you're doing. Some of you, it's been a hard year for you. And maybe you've decided to hold on to your stuff and be a little stingy. And I understand that. But I encourage you, take a risk. Uh, Consider giving generously today to River Church. And you can do that in a safe uh, uh, and a a quick uh, manner on our website. Just go to that giving page. Okay, well, um, I do miss you. I love you. Uh, Lydia, my wife, and I, we're praying for you. Uh, You enjoy the rest of your day.